Chloe, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. For those of you on uh, British Summer Time, good afternoon. For those of you who are overseas elsewhere, uh, either good evening or indeed good morning. Lovely to have you join myself and indeed Chloe, Nicole, my colleagues from the alumni team, all very much part of the Broader Development Trust, an invaluable body of the University of Aberdeen, hugely supportive to the Botanic Gardens, and today's tour is very much a case in point. For those of you who were not able to join us uh, two months ago for the winter tour, uh, lovely to have you here today. We will go over this map briefly. For those of you who were here two months ago, you will recognize this map. It is of the 11 acre Botanic Garden property. The uh, if you're if you're looking at this map now and you're looking uh, at the bottom left, you will see a small red arrow. It, underneath that, it says main gate. That is in real time and place, time and space, coming off the Chanonry. That takes you past the grey buildings that you see there. The one on the right is the Crookshank building. The one on the left is either known as 23 Mac Drive or the Oris building and then from there uh, moving in a westerly direction you're entering the formal botanic garden and the 11 acres the 4.5 hectares in totality again for those of you who were here two months ago you will see some areas of the garden that are very similar from the previous tour but obviously two months on, and therefore we will be focusing on the southern section of the garden initially. Those are the numbers one through five. We will make our way through the central lawn and pond garden, that's the middle third of the garden, number six, where you see the two blue pools, and then uh, we will finish with a very brief introduction to the arboretum, the final third, the northern section, numbers uh, seven, eight, and nine. With, uh, without any further ado, we will move formally into the tour. Uh, Nicole, if you would be kind enough to pull up the, the, um, the video, that would be most kind. Uh, you will immediately see that, um, and it, it's a little more pronounced at different times through today's filming, uh, you'll see that there's a slight listing the port side. Uh, my apologies now, this is my filming of, of um, two days ago and uh, using a screen to see what I was filming and in which direction I was going. Because of the stunning sunshine, it was a glorious day, uh, the glare off the screen was, was um, was noticeable and I couldn't always see the exact angle of the camera so my apologies now. With regards to what you saw a moment ago that was the courtyard, that was the Crookshank building, it is on the eastern flank of the Botanic Garden and it is where plant and soil science is formally taught. You would have also noticed uh, Harris fencing there, the grey panel fencing, not very picturesque and that has been in place since last uh, October with regards to COVID-19 restrictions. And as you'll all be acutely aware with this pandemic, we have had various restrictions, both nationwide and then uh, variants thereof within Scotland. The Scottish government regulations have been adhered to strictly and quite rightly by the university. The Botanic Garden as a magnificent university asset comes under the jurisdiction of the regulations of the campus as a whole and as such the gardens has had sporadic periods of being open to staff students and the general public. Uh, at the moment it is closed but I am delighted to be able to tell you that as of this Monday so the 26th of April the garden will be formally opening to staff students and the general public once again we are already into our normal summer hours and as such we will perpetuate those as of Monday. We're open seven days a week, nine in the morning until seven at night, 0900 until 1900 and as I've indicated every day of the week. So do 
as of this coming Monday. If you're local and able to come and visit, please do. We'll be delightful to see you on site and have you enjoy the garden once again. That Harris fencing has further uses across campus. It will be removed. And if you know the entrance to the garden well, um, by removing that Harris fencing, it can only uh, augment the uh, significant grey cage of the Argon tank. It will once again uh, be in full glory. We are looking westerly at this very moment. Nicole, if you could gradually press forward and we will move along. Those red lockers there on the left, they're bicycle lockers for staff and students. This paved path is the main paved path swinging round uh, to the right and then left uh, to the zoology building. We're looking back here at the Crookshank building as I've indicated. In the foreground there are the peat beds uh, looking very fine at this stage of the year with early uh, spring material coming through. The primulas are a case in point. You'll immediately notice how few trees that are deciduous are, are in leaf. Uh, many are now coming into bud, but there are very few in full leaf. And that's just indicative of the slow spring we've had and the significant cold temperatures. I'll say more about that perhaps on route. You're looking through the uh, vista there is, is to orange barriers that takes you into the nursery. That's our formal uh, service area for composting, uh, nursery stock and staff facilities, garden staff facilities. Once again, we're looking west, the path here taking us through into the birch lawn and beyond. We'll carry on in that direction uh, as we uh, deviate ever so slightly to a couple of beds and trees in the foreground here. Uh, the bed you see there right in front of you on, on the left, almost in centre here, that's bare soil. That is a um, recently improved bed. I use that term perhaps in parentheses, but um, there was a major tree trunk and root mass that we had left in there for the previous uh, three, possibly even four years. And it was of the genus Roos, um, uh, related to sumac and the root mass was just too big to dig out and by letting it rot down in the end we were able to break it up with a substantial 17 pound um, pinch bar and ultimately grab out the remainder with our tractor and forward bucket. That bed is now good to go. Uh, we backfilled with additional compost and, and topsoil and I'm hoping in due course that we can put in a white mulberry there, Morris Alba directly opposite to the right, not visible in this screen, is a black mulberry. It would be nice to have both as visual comparisons and companions. I'm not expecting a white mulberry to fruit this far north at 57 degrees latitude, but nonetheless, it would be lovely if we could grow it on the northern fringe of its, of its hardiness zone. The trunk immediately in front of you is a lime tree, and so we swing gradually to the left, and you'll notice a very distinct uh, white column there. That is the main trunk of a birch tree. The team um, some weeks ago uh, got out buckets of, of uh, soapy water and uh, warm water, making life a little more agreeable, and sponges. And as far as they could reach with ladders at that stage, cleaned up the bark dramatically. And um, as such, we now as a team believe that we're not looking at uh, straight Betula utilis here, a Himalayan birch, but actually a cultivar, um, actually that's incorrect, a variety or, or in some, some people's uh, minds, some taxonomists' minds, a, a subspecies known as Jack Montii, uh, a stunning birch that is very distinct for its white bark. And uh, as you can see here, having washed it down, very significant. Nicole will carry on. Benches uh, throughout the gardens for places to perch and enjoy. Signs on them still reminding people for two metre safe distancing at this point with pandemic restrictions. The azalea beds are uh, directly to the right of both of these beds here. They'll look wonderful in another month and a half, perhaps a month's time. Uh, vibrant colours. The bark here and this multi stem tree uh, is, is stunning. It too is a species of. Um, Asia, it's the Chinese maple, Asa grissium, wonderful peeling okra bark, not visible in this picture, but when backlit late afternoon, 
the shards of flaking bark light up as if they're made of stained glass. Very beautiful, a lovely tree. And to have it complementing the uh, Himalayan birch that you've just seen, peeling bark on one, peeling bark on another, but different genera, different family, um, is rather a nice juxtaposition. In the foreground here, you can see a mass of stones, some we've inherited from previous excavations around the garden. Some uh, we were very fortunate to retrieve when the foundations were being dug out of the new build of the science building uh, due uh, south and west of the Botanic Garden on the opposite side of St Macca Drive. And uh, they very kindly put them aside for us, brought them across. We will use those for a slight gap you can see between Mahonia and Viburnum there to build a new path with Stone, stone sides on either side for, for structural support and it will lead down into the sunken garden. We in fact think there was a path there decades ago which has since been lost. If you had visited the gardens three years ago you would have known this area directly in front of you as our site of the Himalayan blue poppy Mechanopsis, uh, our botanic garden emblem. That collection is now going to return back into the sunken garden where it was originally displayed and, and grown formally again decades ago. Nicole will carry on. I should add that as I'm pointing out some of these uh, ongoing projects, it is I think self-evident to all of you that we have much to do and there is always some progressive work to carry out is very satisfying. Um, forgive me, I wasn't aware that the camera couldn't focus that close, but that um, rather um, chewed uh, stem tissue there with the white pale seed heads was um, uh, um, Honesty, um, uh, Lunaria annua, the, the, the annual honesty, and it gets the genus, the name Lunaria, as in Lunus, that of the moon, because those wonderful seed heads, transparent and circular, have reminded taxonomists, botanists of centuries past of a full moon, so an evocative term. Rhododendrons immediately on our right there, they've just gone over, they're very early flowering, one of them is Rhododendron praecox, and we're coming here to the raised bed, the sectagon, the seven-sided wonderful raised bed design put in by our maid by some of our volunteers and it frames now sadly dead but this rather wonderful structural framework of what was a Camperdown elm, Ulmus glabra Camperdownii, because of its location, because of its wonderful structural form, too good to have failed to ground level and chipped and we have in fact now put guy wires through this more need to go in in due course and we're sending climbers up, the hope being that in the years to come those climbing plants will scramble through the framework there and become pendulous uh, over the branches, uh, evocative once again to the original pendulous form of, of the living elm uh, three years ago. That tree is probably uh, about 90 years old. We had a second plant of a similar size in the collection. It too sadly has died of Dutch elm disease and that we did cut closer down to ground level able to cut, count the tree rings in the process. The house you saw in the far corner there on the left a moment ago, that's uh, part of the original property given to the university when Anne Cruikshank bequeathed the university, uh, the land, some of the property the Cruikshank building included in 1898. That house was known as the head gardener's house. Today it's rented out to private professionals, in this case a couple um, who have been there a number of years. I always say they have the best backyard in Aberdeen. In the foreground there, in that picture a moment ago, you might have seen three look like very miserable um, sticks in the ground. They're actually Magnolia stellata, three of them. They've been there about a decade, do absolutely nothing, just sitting. Um, suddenly, in the last year, they seem to have decided to put on a bit of growth. Long may that continue. We need to bring more magnolias into the collection. Looking across here to some of our beds, known as the evolution beds in the foreground, and then as we swing round to the right, you'll see some of our other tree collections. Uh, this is again known as the um, the uh, beech lawn. Uh, just heading back, just looking at Oris 23 there, or, or, or sorry, 23 St Macca Drive, or the Oris building I mentioned earlier. 
um, and where the labyrinth is, that finished, uh, the wonderful Crocus finished about uh, four weeks ago now. Uh, we have had, if you're not aware, another very cold snap. Five consecutive days of sub-zero with snow on the ground in the opening week uh, or so of early April. So it certainly uh, has kept a lot of plants in check, hence why so few are in full leaf now. It also knocked out some plants in full flower, just, just uh, nipped flowers badly. Sadly, the crocus labyrinth didn't survive as long as it normally does. We're facing due west now. We're heading in that direction. You can see the zoology building just in the background there. And the formal hedgerow in the, in the mid foreground takes you into the rose garden off to the left. We're not heading in that direction on this occasion. We're heading right. And um, just before we get down into the sunken garden, we're on the, on the southern fringe of it here, just highlighting one of our rhododendrons. Um, it, it's just beginning to go out of bloom, but you again can see a little bit of frost damage, hence uh, cold temperatures we have recently had to deal with. Nicole will carry on, thank you. In a moment, we will uh, just make our way through a chain link barrier that's presently in place, uh, blocking us, uh, blocking general public down into the sunken garden um, but um, uh, we'll head down in there and I'll explain more in a moment. That shrub you saw a moment ago with white flowers you didn't see it in, in, in its full size in fact we're pruning it getting it closer to ground level so those wonderful white flowers can be enjoyed seen and smelt. It is a shrub of the olive family uh, the family being oleaceae. The shrub is Osmanthus cross burke woodyi and this is a um, cross between two Osmanthus species, one being um, the Chinese one um, known as Delebea, Delebei, um, Osmanthus Delebei. Um, the other is Osmanthus decorus uh, from the Caucasus. Uh, you get that cross created in the early 1900s by a nursery in uh, Kingston upon Thames, um, London, perhaps as we would know it today. Um, and that was Birkwood, and Skipworth was the nursery name, hence the cultivar name Buck Woody Eye. So we're now moving into the sunken garden. We're on the um, south side, but from a growing standpoint, north aspect means it's cooler, it's darker, it's damper. And even though you're seeing wonderful dappled light come through these pathways, the result is that this side of the sunken garden is predominantly filled with plants, a tolerant of cooler, darker, colder conditions but particularly in this case, plants of the family Ericaceae, the heather family, and rhododendrons specifically. Uh, just in the foreground there is a skimmia, uh, a tough old plant, uh, but doing well. Um, but it's a charming space going down a main path here, uh, which has, you can see in green there, snowdrops on either side. They finished uh, three, four, maybe even, yeah, about four weeks ago now. Um, uh, but lovely when they are in early bloom. Now we're moving down into um, the sunken garden which at the moment is cordoned off and it's cordoned off because of this major volume of earthwork you're seeing in front of you. It's also cordoned off at the moment because uh, last year for much of the growing season myself and the team had to walk away due to the COVID-19 pandemic and to come back to have come back to the garden uh, last July has resulted in us not being able to bring all of the garden back to its, its um, formal state as we wish. The sunken garden at the moment is one area that is getting less um, emphasis and work done to it. Uh, I should also add that sadly we haven't been able to have any garden volunteers to date and some of our volunteers have been hugely influential in not just progressing projects but in the case of the sunken garden helping take a lead and what you're looking at here uh, facing east now is a grotto that uh, we unearthed in the last uh, nine years since I've been at the Botanic Garden and um, the huge stones that were found within this part of the sunken garden are now being gradually moved back into position to build a substantial retaining wall and we will a, maintain the grotto as an interesting space in its own right but that um, peninsula bed there 
will in due course be formally planted up as well. I should add that that mound that you saw a moment ago as we came down the slope, that's going to be dug out. All of the plants, other than that spruce, that spruce will stay there, but all of the other plants have been removed and uh, propagated or, or transplanted elsewhere in the collection. And it is our intent to dig this out, formally dig down and create a small pond in this section of the sunken garden in the future. A uh, long-term project, but one that I think will be charming and a benefit to the garden in future years. This wonderful tree in front of you that's got that very uh, pendulous and, and rustic habit is a North Burmese juniper, um, juniper recurva cox, um, var coxii is its, is its formal Latin name. That plant is probably 50 odd years old. Uh, five years ago we had, six years ago we had a younger specimen, about 35 years old, elsewhere in the gardens. And absolutely tragically, um, it was um, incinerated. It was torched. It was um, it was um, killed by vandals at night who decided to to, to, to come in and uh, start a fire at the base of it. Um, there's nothing humorous about it whatsoever, other than the um, brazen uh, attitude and desire that they they took into their own hands. And so this younger specimen was was destroyed. But blessedly, we have this very fine plant still in our collection. The lawn area here is the one formal area of, of meadow that we only cut once a year. That's because it's got species bulbs in it, particularly for spring and autumn. In a moment as we carry on, you will be able to see the wonderful uh, snakehead fritillaries, um, Fritillaria meleagris, um, famous historically for being really only known down in England at one point in, in more of a damp water meadow type situation. Today they are a much more common plant both in the commercial trade and in botanic gardens and indeed private personal garden. Charming, charming flowers for this time of the year. In a moment, we will be swinging um, in a westerly and slightly northerly direction out of the sunken garden. And you'll get a view of a couple of other species en route, uh, a better view of the zoology building as well, on the western flank. But you can see here our heather collection, um, some of it in flower right now, uh, ongoing work required there, but we're, we're taking out old plants, placing with new, bulking up with other species. The dense growth, the lush leaf growth you see here are predominantly um, bulbous material. In this case, autumn crocus, um, Colchicum autumnale, uh, sometimes known as the naked crocus. Uh, it's an interesting bulb in the sense that at this stage of the year, unlike so many other bulbs, some you've already spied, daffodils, snowdrops, what have you, that come into leaf and flower simultaneously, so this species comes into leaf right now, taking energy down into the bulb, dormant through the summer months, and then in autumn uh, comes up into full flower, uh, but with no leaves. So you have a pale stem and a beautiful cup-shaped pink, uh, yeah, pale pink flower, hence some of the various common names it has. You can also see directly above um, a relatively young, probably, 15, maybe as much as 20, 15, 15 year old cherry there. It is um, uh, Prunus cross uh, Yedinensi uh, cultivar Morhemii. And the actual species is a plant that for the last century has been planted extensively in China, particularly in Tokyo. Um, famous uh, species of that, of Japan. It's native to, to, to that part of the world. Lovely plant. Uh, we've got a much older specimen in the Crookshank courtyard, near, or directly opposite the Crookshank building, this younger plant. Uh, we transplanted uh, five, six years ago, and it's doing particularly well. And to be able to look up into the flowers right now from a lower level is really rather charming. Um, but a young plant at this stage, but very fine. We make our way up the pathway. This is a path that we significantly 
increased in width some years ago, allowing machinery down into the sunken garden. You're looking here at the zoology building, golden yew there, um, stigit yew, um, you're an uh, Irish golden yew. And so on the western flank here, we're stepping out onto that paved path. You saw right at the beginning of the tour at the Cruikshank building um, courtyard. And we're looking now westerly, uh, sorry, my apologies, we're looking easterly down at the herbaceous border. And this is one of the outstanding displays of the Botanic Garden. It's a bed that's 87 meters long, um, over 200 foot, uh, about um, um, five meters wide, about 15 foot. It's substantial. And in recent years, we've actually put two pathways directly through perpendicular to the length. And you can't see them now, they're in shadow, but equally, when the growth of the herbaceous border um, is, is, is at its full glory in uh, mid to late summer. So you could be walking down one side, this is a double-sided herbaceous border. Um, means that just that you can stroll down both sides, enjoy it from both sides. You could have a colleague down one side, you could be walking down the other, and there will be times where you can hear each other but not see each other. The, the significant change in growth is substantial. It's very fine. Very fine indeed. The stakes there um, allow us to have netting pulled taut across and that gives support to the plants as they grow up and through. And so this dividing wall is taking us into the second third of the Botanic Garden into historically what was known as the Rock Garden. It was a rock garden. It was created by my longest serving predecessor in the late 60s and into the early 1970s. Today much of that Alpine collection which is synonymous with a rock garden, has sadly been lost. Indeed, many of the young conifers that were put in to symbolize or, or evoke that you were just above the tree line moving into an alpine collection have now become mature plants in their own right. Uh, it has changed the, set, the, the, the rock garden as was. Indeed, since arriving, I've also changed the name of the location to match the change in foliage and, and the living collection to Central Lawn and Pond Garden. But you come through that gate and you can see there some wonderful spring collection on the left. We're now looking forward up and about to swing right. I should also add that we are due some fairly major construction within our uh, nursery area, our, our service area. And ultimately that means that the route on level ground through the nursery into this section of the botanic garden will be corned off permanently and so the steps you saw there through the archway will become a formal ramp allowing wheelchair users and buggy users to still enter this second third of the botanic garden further ongoing project again just highlighting how few of the deciduous trees have come into leaf at this stage but what a transformation from uh, eight weeks ago two months ago when we last had this virtual tour you're looking here at a wonderful mass ground cover now of hellebores, um, Lenten rose, and the pathways here that have been put in are, I think, a huge success. This was done by our volunteers with the wonderful timber siding, and timber edges. Uh, you've seen camellias, which we need to bulk up along the, the wall there. Again, uh, they may be on the south side, uh, but they're north aspects, so cooler, damper, once again, uh, the wall create helping create those conditions as did the rhodos in the sunken garden. Uh, various rhododendrons now coming into flower, um, sadly not all are, are named down to species level but a stunning white one here but some of these rhododendrons have now reached a size and height where as we walk through them uh, with this tour and indeed when you visit formally not only do you get this lovely dappled light coming through but you get to see the variation in bark color and texture. Um, it is, I think, a further highlight of rhododendrons, particularly when they are semi-mature to mature. Uh, you can see those contorted limbs there as well, some of them in previous decades battling for light, but today evoking a really rather beautiful scene. Uh, one of the pathways here, looking back up into the pond system, this has been um, dramatically improved by my garden team and again volunteers over the last 18 months. 
sadly we weren't at this stage last year able to enjoy this we were already in national lockdown but the transformation to the pond system as i alluded to earlier put in in the late 60s early 70s has resulted in us being able to find the original dimensions of the pond system there's, there's uh, five different ponds of various sizes with a pump system where water is pumped at the top trickling back down through lovely evocative sound of running water uh, when visiting but it's uh, by unearthing what was originally put in uh, it's also allowed us to alter and change some of the original scope of the design making it more manageable for the team today i should add if some of you are not aware that this botanic garden of four and a half hectares 11 acres was originally managed by a head gardener and eight full-time gardeners in the early 1980s that dramatically changed to a head gardener and four uh because we could just stop there for a second to four uh gardeners when i arrived in 2012 I inherited a wonderful team in the capacity of richard walker head gardener two full-time gardeners, I'm delighted to say that those numbers have gradually improved. Today we have, uh, forgive me, when I first arrived it was two and a half full-time gardeners, there's still two and a half full-time gardeners, but we, um, through the help of the friends of Cookshank Botanic Garden, have a trainee uh, each year, and we also now have an apprentice, which is magnificent, four um, superb individuals, hugely beneficial to maintaining the collection but more than that very very good at sharing their knowledge their skill set encouraging and training volunteers in the process now um, what you see in the foreground here is is, um, is probably um, classed as an embarrassment it's something that I um, was able to come across with Richard Walker head gardener only a matter of weeks ago and this was with regards to um, uh, the team doing major revamping work of the rhododendron collection at this section of the central lawn and pond garden lo and behold we found this rhododendron which is healthy um, above the damage here uh, amazingly we found this spiraled and what you're looking at here is just one side but a spiral set of damage that probably rises about 40 centimeters above ground level quite extraordinary and while we don't know um, why this damage was not um, managed and foreseen decades ago we surmise that when this plant was put in uh, a tree guard a one of the spiraling and they're white in color was the material but um, one of the tree guards was put in wrapped around and it just was not removed in time uh, it didn't have that innate springiness in it and so the tree actually uh, grew into the guard and at some point it was was removed or it perished broke down uh, due to the sunlight condition but an interesting visual phenomenon moving into open open an open gap here you can see the volume of light remember this is north aspect so it's still quite cool and damp but the major trunk there both horizontal and, and the remnants in the ground was of an elm it too tragically died from dutch elm disease and uh, had to be felled about four years ago it is still my desire to have that trunk cut in half the main trunk lying horizontal having two huge uh, slabs that can then be turned into long seats and um, possibly create an awning in this space in, in the future and have it as a outdoor sitting area providing a bit of weather protection as well again uh, here we are on the eastern fringe but, but beginning to look north northwest eastern fringe of the central lawn and pond garden uh, beds here that have seasonal variation but begin to look very good at this time of the year particularly with um, early spring iris and primula the daffodil on this occasion coming through um, further rhododendrons here uh, this is rhododendron rex a magnificent plant um, sadly now th uh, threatened in its, its native habitat but wonderfully long leaves uh, leaves must be at least uh, 20 centimeters uh, seven inches or so um, with a wonderful um, a soft brown underside you can see the, the, um, the flowers there looking quite wonderful where the primulas um, charming to see at this stage of the year 
and in a moment we will move along this bed and you will be able to see um, uh, um, cardamine uh, pentaphylos, um, lovely pink, pinky purple flower, a pentaphylos that are five sided. You can see the leaves there, um, five almost uh, five digits of, a, of, a, of an individual's hand. Uh, a lovely plant of this year coming up in, 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 um, in a very visible context. It gradually dies off through the summer months, but lovely to have in situ at this time of the year. The trunks where we're walking past with, with relative speed here are some of our major trees. I'll highlight those. The benches you saw there, I've said that we have plenty of seating area in the botanics. Uh, while the garden has been closed by team, again, for social distancing, quite rightly, when the weather's good, been sitting outside, and the benches you see there is, is one of the aspects, one of the areas they were using for their breaks. Uh, the, I should add, those benches for Monday will be moved back into their former positions for everyone else to enjoy and use. The tri trunks here, um, all fused together. This is a stunning tree of probably a century old now. It is a Robel, R-O-B-L-E, Robel beech, not a fagus obliqua from Chile. And directly behind that, you can see another Chilean plant. The monkey pies are very evocative in shape and size. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on, Nicole. You will spy there very quickly some of the glass, as in greenhouse glass of our nursery area. The tree slightly off to your right as we move ahead with that um, khaki coloured leaf is a um, an oak from the Mediterranean basin, um, Quercus ilex, the, the home oak, uh, probably the best example in the northeast. That, that tree there is very, very fine indeed. The young plant we're coming to here ultimately will replace the birch that you may have just spied off to your left. The birch is probably over a century old, a very significant, very old tree in, in the form of a birch, but uh, which the pendular of British native. This is a Liriodendron julipifera, the tulip tree from East Coast North America in the foreground. Really quite young at this stage, but forward planning um, uh, hopefully will allow that tree in due course to take up the stature and um, significance of the birch as and when we tragically lose it. The um, multi-stem shrub you're beginning to see to your right uh, is Prunus incisor, an early flowering cherry. It finished flowering three weeks ago. Uh, beautiful plant, always a harbinger of, of spring as it comes into flower. Again, quick look down to the left there to see the some of the pond systems in place and there's just the, the prunus incisor. Um, just make out some of the flowers that are beginning to, to go over. All of these rocks were positioned by my predecessors, all part of that original rock garden planning design. Enormous work at this time. This pond is quite shallow, always had, has frog spawn in it. Um, and, and indeed, those frogs spawned there about four or five weeks ago. Invariably, it seems to arrive before all of the frost is finished. And so we never think too much of this spawn actually survives. Walking up the Western Path here, taking us towards the Arboretum. And this is a um, very significant uh, sycamore. Um, you may or may not think that that's a tree of great worthiness, given the right space and location. They are magnificent trees. And uh, this tree is, is becoming very significant in its own right, not least because of the extraordinary swirling stems of ivy growing up but in a moment you will see that we have very consciously cut the stems uh, roughly at, at, at about uh, five foot about uh, eight to 20 above ground level uh, you'll also see how we've cut those stems this is so that the ivy does die off above the cut zone and um, reduces what's referred to as the sale area deciduous trees in winter with with ivy on them for all intensive purposes can appear to still be in leaf and that with winter winds can cause potential storm damage. You'll see there the cuts and you'll see that it's more than just cutting through the single stem of ivy, it's physically taking out a chunk, almost a fist thickness um, or a width of, of one's fist and closing, closing your individual hand. The reason for that is that if you do a single cut of an ivy stem like that and leave it, it can refuse. Um, it's a very, very significant uh, 
time native and, and wonderful in its own right. Late flowering produces pollen and nectar for insects late in the growing season. Um, it definitely has its place, but certainly in this botanic collection, we don't want it climbing up all of our trees. Again, gradually making our way north here and, and slightly west. This path deviates, a bit of a dog leg takes us round into the arboretum. The path immediately breaking off to the right takes us down into the nursery once again. The path we've just walked when I first arrived in 2012 had been partially completed by the team. Uh, when I arrived, we then completed it as you see today. And we've just bought new path materials, granite dust, hardcore materials, what have you. Some of these paths will be uh, resurfaced once again. The green fence line you see on the left hand side is a significant improvement. Again, this has gone in since my curatorship started. Prior to that, we had, and you'll see this as we get to the gate, we had the very thin black um, mesh, wire mesh, um, along the western flank. This could be easily damaged um, or cut, people getting in illegally. And as they left a hole in the gate, so deer would then come in. And just to say, deer may look beautiful, but they don't mix with a botanic collection when they rub and eat the plants that we are trying to grow. And so this new fence, having gone in, has stopped any deer getting into the collection, particularly into the arboretum. And it really has allowed us to change our planting and planning policy within the arboretum, which is, is very pleasing indeed. So we're making our way into uh, the arboretum now. This is the final third of the botanic collection. It's the northern end. And up until um, the 19, uh, early 1960s, this was a market garden, this area of botanic garden. The university bought this additional land to augment the original seven acres. And it is a charming space in its own right. It does allow us, as per the term arboretum, to significantly show species of tree first and foremost. Having said that, the sloped bed on your left hand side here is our Asiatic collection. We're gradually adding to that. And again, we have some seating area up here, some of it formal, some of it rustic. Formal context includes this bench here. And as we uh, pan across the words, you're able to read in loving memory of Charles Gingham, who very sadly died a few years ago. He was a very significant professor and academic of the university, huge supporter of the Botanic Garden, Regis Keeper of Botany at one point, and his main area of research was in heathland restoration and natural growth. And his work really was very leading and policy making to help create the Cairngorm National Park, as we now know. So a leading light in his own right, and charming that his family should have recently decided to have um, purchased and had two benches put into the botanic collection in memory of him and his significant work. We're panning here from north into an easterly direction, and you can see at the very far uh, end of the horizon there two two spikes. Those are the double spires of St Macca's Cathedral, and biased though I am, I think this is the best view on campus, certainly of great historic significance for the simple reason that as we look down the slope here in the foreground, meadow collections that come to their best in the months to come. So we look down to the cathedral, the founding site of this university in 1495. And um, it's lovely to have it within the view of the university property. And so we come to the end of today's talk. Thank you, as ever, for listening. Thank you. Very much. That was uh, that was fantastic, just as great as it was before, and it was lovely seeing the gardens uh, in the sunshine, uh, blooming in spring. So we'll begin with our questions. So we did get a couple during the uh, during your talk. So I'll just kick off with the first one, um, and again. Apologies for any pronunciation errors on my part. Um, do you have a Coel Rutiera Pinata tree uh, slash Pride of India in the garden? 
<laughs> it is exceedingly rare for me to be able to give a straight yes or a straight no. On this occasion, no. Um, but um, it is always nice to get such questions, if only to think, why do we not have such a plant in our collection? Or if we did, why is it no longer in our collection? And so I am going to add this to my list of suitable, potentially suitable plants that we can bring to Cookshank Botanics. Thank you very much for whomever asked that question. Thank you. Um, our next one is how challenging was it to choose appropriate plants century by century to go into the 525 gin and um, maybe in case anyone isn't familiar um, last year we launched a 525 gin um, which Mark played a very very vital role in um, to celebrate the university's 525th anniversary we did it with Gorter's gin and um, there are seven uh, botanics of botanics from each century um, that Mark uh, carefully selected for us so I'll let him uh, explain that a little bit more and how challenging it was to maybe pick them. Um, I, I'd like to tell you that it took hours of labour and, and, and vast amounts of deliberation. Um, I think that's probably a lie but equally it, it did take some, some, some time less to choose the actual plants, more to decide which century they were of significant value and use historically because the chosen plants have obviously have got to have an edible um, association with them um, and therefore palatable and 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 um, suitable to be able to in this case going go into a into a um, a gin mixture, um, but it was also matching um, the history of, of, of those plants um, over time. So um, uh, pears, for instance, have had an interesting history of, of um, memory of about four centuries within Scotland, southern Scotland, south of here, that is. Um, whereas, uh, and of course, they're still in use today, but but not necessarily. Um, formally as a, as a leading drink in their own right, although we know pear cider. Nettles, well, nettles were brought over by the Romans to the British Isles, um, and they had medicinal use, but not as, as a drink per se. Um, and yet, we can still use them to this, to this, um, this very year, this very day. So um, it was really deciding um, which plants had a significant historical element to the century that was necessary to span the 525 years of the age of, of the university. Uh, overall, with regards to, to which plants to choose, they had to be in the botanic collection, uh, not necessarily grown at volume. Um, the, the company that's produced the gin uh, did source from, from elsewhere, not least because some were out of season in our own garden at the time but they had to be growing in the botanic garden and they had to be edible. Those were the two leading criteria. Thank you. Um, we've got a message from um, Claire who said, thank you very much, um, Mark, for showing um, her father's bench, uh, which enables um, giving him his far field to appreciate it. So thank you also for adding that comment, Claire. Um, our next question is, uh, which is the oldest tree in the garden? How old is it and where is it located? <laughs> um, this is a common question and, and for every few years that goes by the, the, we're, we're beginning to need to change our answer because tragically the oldest tree uh, by, its, by, by, by default is, is beginning to show um, wear and tear and damage. We think our oldest tree in the collection at the moment is a very fine beech tree in the southern section. Uh, southern eastern section of the Arboretum. In fact, while I didn't highlight it uh, near the end of today's uh, virtual tour, as we looked down the slope to the double spires of St Macca's Cathedral, one of the very significant trees slightly off to the right, not in leaf at the moment, is that very ancient uh, beech tree. And if I said birch, apologies, beech tree. And uh, it's straight Fagus sylvatica, our, 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 our British native. It's a stunning plant. We think it's about 
150, 160 years old. Um, and there were others that we've tragically had to fail, some before my time, some, some since I've been in post, and they've all been in a straight line. So we can only assume that even though that land was a market garden, that those trees were maintained as, as part of a historic boundary. That's our assumption. Thank you. And we've had lots of lovely comments from people saying thank you very much for an interesting and informative tour. Great to see the gardens snow free this time. Um, our next <laughs> one is, are we doing a summer tour? I think if Mark agrees, which I think you're going to, then yes, then, yeah, yes we, we are. See that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll here, do a summer here, tour. Here first, folks. So yeah, we'll, we'll do a summer <laughs> tour as well. And uh, that'll be a nice opportunity to see how the gardens uh, progress, uh, hopefully, with some sunshine in Aberdeen. Um, a lovely comment um, saying that um, that we used to go there with uh, my father, Dr. Charles Strachan of the uh, Natfield Department, and that's from Molly. Uh, thank you. That's also really lovely to hear. It's lovely to hear of the connections that Good. people have with the gardens. Um, our next question is, is there a um, part of the garden which, given the resource, you'd like to change radically? I think the sunken garden is a case in point. Uh, you've heard some of my plans about the sunken garden today and, and you've seen the, 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 the um, very gradual progression we've got it to at this stage. Um, radical in the sense that what we need to do is still substantial in the sunken garden. Um, overall, the western side is not going to dramatically change where you saw the spring bulb meadow. Um, and while I didn't highlight the, the um, south aspect, the, the, the northern beds, they will gradually improve with, with different species being put in. But it's the eastern flank where we want to dig down, create a pool, create a pond, um, in, 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 in turn put in a slightly smaller um, bulb meadow as well to complement the large one. Um, that's going to significantly um, take time and effort. Um, I think more than anything, what would be really lovely, and I would argue very necessary for the gardens, which we just do not have, is covered space, formal covered space. Um, when we started today's virtual tour, you were able to see um, just to the left of the entrance into our nursery, a small summer house. Um, well, that fits four if you like each other. Um, we need to do better than that in the botanics. We need a formal space that can be used for um, the general public to enjoy and shelter if required for uh, teaching, be that with my colleagues in the uh, Aberdeen Biodiversity Centre or um, academics, lecturers who, who wish to formally teach in the garden. It would also be lovely to have a space that has dual use and, and um, could perhaps be used for, for silver service for, for corporate events um, out of hours. I think that would be really, really special. So yes, a, a, a if I were to use the term radical, um, um, would be that of formal, proper, covered space that has multiple functions and, and some facilities. Thank you. Um, we just had one more comment saying, um, great to hear that we'll be doing a summer tour. Um, thank you also again for the lovely virtual visit. Uh, Morna and Peter are saying that they remember the garden from the late 70s. Um, that's just as I was saying earlier, it's lovely to hear about the connections and the history that you know people share with them. Um, another person saying thank you for an interesting talk. So I think we're kind of basically like on the nose time wise. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, then we might maybe wrap things up there um, and just say a huge thank you to Mark for another really, really fascinating talk and also for being our videographer as well and doing some filming on Monday that was great of you too um, and thanks pleasure. to everyone who's joined us and um, we hope that you'll join us again for our, for our summer garden walk uh, the next one in the series <laughs> with Mark Patterson so yeah thank you and I hope um, everyone enjoys the rest of your day or morning or evening wherever you are hopefully it's nice and sunny like it is today <laughs>